live. Over here. Yep. Just no, I was checking know, on my phone. Got the live just button. Make, just, just to make sure. You guys get notifications? Yep. 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 It's on. I don't want I don't want you to start. We're good. So we're live. We are not dead. We are alive. Um, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, people who are tuning into this. Um, I'm gonna jump in and uh, get out of the way. So I'm Andy Burton, or, or I run real, the real producer, at least I allegedly try to run the real producers platform here in Chicago. I think I do a good job. It, it's above average, at least that's, uh, you know, I'll give myself a solid seven. Um, but no, our goal with our platform, it's not just a publication. It is really to connect, elevate and inspire the, you know, players in the industry, realtor, top realtors, um, partners in Chicago. And, um, you know, we, we've been through a lot this past year almost on the dot. Um, I was coming up thinking March was when the whole thing, mid-March shut down. So we are about the 10-month the ten month mark of just quarantine. And when it's difficult to connect with people in 10 plus, this is what we've got. This is our jam. Um, and so it's really an honor to connect everybody. Um, I, I have, um, the feedback that we've received from these little jam sessions is people are like, yeah, it's just good inspiration. And it's nice to know that, you know, I'm not alone. The thoughts in my head navigating the market, you know, it's nice to know that people who are selling 20, 30, 40, you know, 50 million plus dollars a year in volume in real estate are experiencing those same challenges. So you're not alone. Um, people have been using this as a resource. I, <laughs> I had somebody tell me, they're like, yeah, I put it on my car. It's kind of like a podcast, you know? So um, I, I'm just, I'm blessed to do this. It's fun. We have a great lineup as we always do. I say that every time, but that's because we have a great lineup every time. You know, what do you, what can you say? And so I want to allow the realtors very briefly to introduce themselves, then the partners, and then uh, I'm going to get out of the way and we'll start jamming. So uh, that being said, Realtors, um, Teresa, why don't, why don't you kick us off? My name is Teresa Hahn. I'm with Compass uh, almost three years, but I've been in real estate for 15. Guys, we went over the order, you know. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I wasn't I sure planned. if you were going to cue me up or not. Uh, Tom <laughs> Campone, I'm with Keller Williams, One Chicago. Uh, I've been in the business. Uh, I've been with Ke Keller for a year uh, and I've been in the business five years now. Ben Lalez, I'm also at Compass, been doing this for about 10 years. Bruce Glazer, I'm with App Properties and going on nine. I'll go. Michael, go. Mike Shin here. I am uh, with. Coldwell Banker Realty. I've been with Coldwell Banker for eight years. I've been there in my entire career. Um, I have been in the real estate industry as a builder and home flipper for about 21 years, 21 years. That's great. A lot of experience on this. And Bruce, uh, by far, you have the best background. Um, <laughs> that is that is not a biased statement at all, at all. Represent. Uh, that's right. Remember back in the day when uh, it was from one of our events, right? Um, I think back in the day when we can meet with people back when times were perfectly normally precedented and we didn't have to pivot and do all the cliche things that uh, we're doing these days. Um, so as the realtors introduce themselves, I'm allowed a lot of the partners to, to introduce themselves as well. Now, I, I will say most of you know me. I, I keep it light. I, I This is the 1% of my week where I am, I mean, I take that back. I do parent in a, in a serious mode. I do throw on the dad voice every now and then, but in work mode, this is the 1% of my week where I will just tell you, like, I, I literally cannot do what I do without our partners. Um, we are 100% supported. It is a pure platform. We, we do all of our features based on nominations and closed production, you know, merit essentially. And so um, this is where the ideas come from. This is where the funding comes from to make the platform alive and, and breathing and just and consistent and sustainable. And so um, with that, I, I Tammy, Michael, um, you know, Stuart, I, I, I literally cannot do, I'm unemployed without you guys. So I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, you got us through 2020. We appreciate it. Realtors, if you enjoy what we do, give these people some love. I mean, this is, uh, this is, you know, where, where everything comes from and how, how we're able to breathe. So Tammy, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, kick us off on the partner department? All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll say that, you know what, we're all ineffective without each other for sure. So it's one industry, many facets to it. 
Um, but I appreciate all of you on here and I've actually been on deals with many of you um, and helped buyers. But I'm Tammy Hajar Miller with the Federal Savings Bank. I've been with the bank for a little over seven years in the industry for almost 16. Um, I've helped thousands of buyers at this point into new homes over my career. And uh, I'll say, Mike, you know what? Our, us Asians hold our persuasion. So I am enamored that you have been in the industry for 20 plus years because you look so young. That's awesome. Um, but it is so cool to be on here. Thank you again, Andy, for coordinating this. It's a lot of fun. Last year was interesting, but the disruption, I think, is uh, opening up many opportunities for all of us. I'm, uh, I'm Mike Mazik. Uh, Tammy, this is our second one together. This is awesome. Um, so my name is Mike Mazik. I'm a real estate attorney. Uh, I've been practicing for 15 years. I've had my own practice for 11 years and we do real estate transactions. We do real estate litigation as well as estate planning, probate work. So most of our practice uh, is focused on protecting client assets. So whether it's real estate or a business or things like that, uh, that's what we do. And uh, good morning, I'm Stuart Keishan from Keishan Inspection Services. I'm a home inspector. Um, this is, I'm going on my 28th year and uh, I started really young. And, I was one of the youngest ones in all the continuing ed classes back then, and I'm still one of the youngest ones. <laughs> it's an old man in the street. Thanks, Stuart. No, we, we appreciate it. And uh, with that, I'm going to get out of the way. Let's let's start jamming. So um, I'm going to just kind of open floor. What do you uh, what do you think would be the most beneficial to the group? What do you guys want to start talking about? So I guess I'll kick it off. Uh, I think all of us are kind of in the same position where. It's either low inventory or our buyers don't want to touch the uh, stale inventory that's kind of set since before Thanksgiving. And kind of at the same time, more buyers coming out and you start seeing some of these older listings coming off the market. So it's in, something, something's happening right now. I think the market is in flux. I'm curious to hear what's uh, going on for you guys. It's cooking. It seems like it really started about after the election. I think, you know, just uh, Chicago loves the uh, new president, <laughs> not to get political, but it is what it is. And uh, vaccines rolling out. I think people are more confident to come come out. A lot of people held off last year, it seems like, or we're, we're getting ready to start and put it on hold. So I think there's just an influx of people coming out of the woodwork or accelerating their moves that's what i'm seeing yeah i would i would agree december saw a lot more activity brad kind or ben kind of like what you mentioned where some of this inventory went on in the fall between the election and the pandemic not a lot of activity and then after things settled with the election it was like all of a sudden things started to pick up in december and then second week in january actually first week in january stuff that wasn't getting showings forever, all of a sudden you got four or five showings on a listing. It's like, where did this come from? So uh, I do think though that it's not evenly distributed. You know, when I look at the data, you know, a lot of this is being driven by buyers looking for more space. So historically, these one bedroom units that were first time home buyers, they were picked up super quick. And now we're seeing with the low rates, people are saying, hey, maybe I can afford that two bedroom unit, right? So a lot of the price increases and in, in inventory have been unevenly distributed just as far as what buyers are looking for. I think one of the bigger questions that you know we're kind of trying to navigate is, okay, inventory is gonna come, whether it's this week or you know, at traditional time in the spring, if it comes, is it going to be enough to satisfy the buyers that are out there now? And, or are there going to be so many more buyers that, you know, it becomes ultra seller friendly or the exact opposite. There's just too much inventory and not enough buyers and, you know, prices become depressed again. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm looking at that stuff all day, trying to figure out where it's going to go. I mean, we're prepared for any of those situations, but again, curious, like predictions. I think it depends on the neighborhood. Um, 
you know, we couldn't keep anything in stock if you were in uh, Logan Square, Pilsen, Avondale. Um, but our downtown listings are very stale. They're sitting a long time. I talked to a lot of agents that only do business in like River North or River West. Um, and the consensus is don't press the panic button, you know, if ever. Um, but we are seeing a lot of buyers coming in. I've got several buyers that aren't looking at my listings, even though that's like within their criteria. Um, but they're really trying to lowball everything. You know, they're coming in like 85, 87% of list price, um, which is historically pretty, you know, um, unheard of. We never really saw that in, you know, luxury high rise buildings in downtown area. I saw a big exodus from the city. A lot of people moving to outskirts of the city, um, people foregoing the, the two bedroom, two bath condo and immediately going to a single family home where they can have some outdoor space. Um, people going to suburbs when they never really had the suburbs on their radar. But now with the election over, the possibility of a vaccine insight um, and their um, employers saying, hey, we're probably gonna be back in the office sometime in 2021. <clears throat> I've got a lot of homeowners now that are like, oh crap, we might have to move back towards the city where we're in Arlington Heights now. That's a long commute in. We didn't think we were going to go back for at least a couple of years, but you know, that's going to be a murderous commute. So I'm starting to see that influx back into the city. Did you guys, and I, I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. I have a lot of clients that are asking whether this trend, whether this is a trend or if this is more of a one-time event, because a lot of people, at least from my buyers, I'm seeing people and sellers, people that we're planning on going to the suburbs anyway in two to three years that decided to pull the trigger when the uncertainty was high. And the question is, is that a trend for Chicago long-term or is this more of a one-time event? And I, I personally looking at people's situations and, and the data think this is more of a one-time event, but I'm interested to hear what everyone else thinks. I agree. I think it's a one-time event. Um, Short term. I would say, yeah, I would say that a good, 70% of 75% of my, my sphere, um, they want to stay in the city and they're like, they're gung ho. They they want to stay in the city forever. Um, that 25%, they're going back out to the suburbs. They were going to go to the suburbs anyway. Um, and I'm not seeing that trend change that much. I, do I think there's a bigger question here. And that's like what these companies who are employing thousands in Chicago are going to do with regards to work from home. So yeah, maybe in a microcosm, we're seeing, you know, it could feel like a, a one-time shift, but if these companies implement a, a more favorable work from home policy, like you may have people more open to the idea. So yeah, we have that like one big, one big shift, but I think, I think the landscape's gonna change just period, but it's going to be much, a much more marginal effect over the years as people as companies become more tech savvy. Sorry to interrupt there, Michael. Go ahead. No, no, I was just I was just going to say to, to, to follow up on that. I, I've had so many clients who you know previously were employed by a company but did certain work that could be considered independent contracting work, where we're creating a, a, an entity for them. We create a business for them, and they're sort of in a different arrangement with their employer, and then they create those terms. So they're not they're not going into the office. And one of the main negotiation you know, points of that type of arrangement is they don't want to physically go back into the office. Now, there's still going to be a need to be in certain offices and certain commercial space physically. But yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely seen a lot more people, you know, use their work relationship to make their housing choices. And same thing with schools and education, you know, a lot more clients of, you know, depending on their, you know, they would choose a certain neighborhood because the Chicago public school was a very good public school. In a remote learning environment, everything changes. You know, you can learn from somebody overseas or in another state or anything like that. So it definitely changes the home dynamic as well. I think it's still Chicago. We're the third biggest city in the States, whether you're working from home or not. Uh, once downtown reopens again, restaurants, why would you not want to be downtown? It's, it's the best, especially in the summertime. So I think regardless of working from home or whatnot, there will be a resurgence in the city. 
I think we felt it last last year when the city was reopening too. I mean, a lot of a bulk of our sales seem like to happen from uh, May, June, July, um, and and that was because the city was beginning to reopen again. So I think once once that comes back, hospitality conventions, people will be back here again. Yeah, people will come back to the city because the city is so dynamic. To your point, right, Bruce? And yeah. and I think the other thing to think of is. Now, I do think the, the pandemic has disrupted, yes, the work life may be um, day to day, but the reality is, is we have to look at the homes that we have and how are we able to change them so they can work comfortably from home and, you know, some ideas around that because people love just the proximity to everything. And I think we do have an inventory struggle this year um, and it's going to get tighter in my professional opinion. And I, you know, I'm curious actually for the realtors on this call and for the, all of us partners, we're all going to, know how are you using your lender to get your buyers in on properties? I mean, over the last, what is today, Tuesday, just between Sunday and Monday, I was on four different calls with the listing agent, just making sure they understood the position of financing for the buyers because they're all in multiple offer situations, whether it was a city and or in the suburbs. And whether it's, you know, the lender reputation that your preferred lender has, or just my previous experience with VA lending, with whatever type of lending the, the consumer needs, excuse me, needs, you know, the reality is money is on sale. So we, as the lending partner, need to help you win the deal, right? If you're representing the buyer and understanding financing for, as, as you're the listing agent, understanding the financing available to your buyer base so you know how to market that even better. I think the lending relationship, the partnerships from the inspectors to the attorneys, you know, how quickly can we get this done? Is title clean? What else is going on? How does this home view? I honestly think the um, relationships we have this year is going to help us get through some of the inventory challenges and more buyers are coming. And money is still on sale. And I think it's going to stay on sale, at least for the first half of this year. So that's going to create a pent up demand. And we're probably still going to see prices go up a little bit, um, city or, or not, right? The, the city's going to come back. Chicago will survive this. Maybe a little blip, but Chicago for sure will survive this. So how are we going to figure out what that opportunity is um, moving forward? Because this is just a moment in time. Tammy, I think what you you might act what you might be talking about. So yeah, agreed. It's important to have a lender that is known, and you know the seller and listing agent feel like they can get the job done. But like when you're putting an offer together, and maybe this is something that you know I've only been really doing this for about two three years, and I didn't really understand that your offer is like a package, and part of the package is a good broker who like knows how to get the deal done, a good lender, a good lawyer, a good inspector. So when you're presenting these offers, yeah, it's a package. Price is obviously a really, probably the most important factor. But like, if I'm working with Bruce or something, it's okay. He knows I'm a known entity. He knows the lender. He's probably worked with the lawyer and it's going to be, you know, I'm presenting the smoothest possible plan from this offer to the closing table. And I'm hoping that, you know, you know, Bruce or Tom or, or Michael, they're expressing that to their seller, like, Hey, they might be five grand less, but the likelihood that they close is 50% greater. There's not going to be any games that, that kind of thing. That's really important, especially going into a, a scenario like we expect, you know, now and, through probably March, April. Yeah, I always talk about submitting an offer. It's kind of like um, applying for colleges. You know, grade point average is very important. There's a lot of weight in that, but they're also gonna look at all the other things, you know, extracurricular activities, letters of recommendation. Those are all really important. Um, and we've won offers in multiple offer situations where we might not have been the top price, but they like the entire package and it happens a lot. Um, yes, it's very important. Coming back to what uh, I think Tammy was touching on earlier about how this like 
okay, yeah, people want to come back to the city because it's dynamic and exciting, et cetera. I think there's something so much more basic that like everyone, myself included, just like wants normalcy and like wants to like go back to the way things were like and moving out to the suburbs and interacting with shopping plazas, that's not going to be normal for me. And that's not going to be normal for my clients. So I think that's going to be just a really strong pull for people to just get back to their old lives. I agree. I think it's going to take a, a couple of years for them to find that they may be bored and want to come back into the city. So. I think that 25% compared to 75% is similar to my sphere as well. Like Michael said, um, you know, people have parents or grew up in the suburbs, then they'll probably boomerang back there. But I think, you know, people that like to run on the lake or go to concerts or pick up and try a new, you know, after hours or happy hour spot or something like that. Um, I don't, it's just such a different lifestyle out there. So uh, mm. out there as in <laughs> any suburb, I think, and I don't have a lot of a, a suburb experience, but I've gone out there um, and help people try to pick from the five neighboring suburbs here. And half of them decided just to stay in Chicago and maybe a different, not their like original place that they thought they would end up, but in a different Chicago neighborhood, just because the panic of, not being in Chicago outweighed, yeah. you know. And, and I think I it's the dynamic of the family, right? If you look at millennials, it's it's our biggest opportunity right now. It's the biggest chunk of buyers right now are the millennials. And they're kind of the, what, it's about the age of 30. So if you look at where they are in their careers and keeping downtown is still extremely appealing to them. And they probably do need to go to the office. I mean, I have a lot of young team members on my own team and I, they need that interaction. They need the human connection. And so those are still looking to stay in the city and they're so actively looking in the city. Now they may look in different parts of the city. I've kind of seen, you know, maybe they're looking along the brown line because they like the brown line or the blue line, or, you know, maybe they're not as dependent on a vehicle. So they're moving a little further out, but they still want transportation ease, but they still need to go to the office and they want to be a part of the action because they think to themselves, I'm only going to be this age once and I don't have kids yet. So I'm going to live here now. And then maybe like to Teresa's point, they boomerang back out to, you know, the suburb of where they grew up, but there, there's still so much appeal here in the city. I mean, I grew up at Belmont Broadway. I don't know where everybody grew up, but I love the city, absolutely love the city. And for, okay, not ideal last year, but you know, sometimes I'll be honest, I just walk downtown, I'm like, this is so peaceful. It's amazing. I've never been able to walk downtown and really see, you know, LaSalle and see the whole, all the way down from the bridge on Wacker and in its beauty, right? So I think there's things you can highlight, but. I will say, you know, being at the corner of Randolph and, um, and Michigan, kind of like, you know, at the Heritage Building where my mom lives, um, you know, now just being able to, to have like a walking treadmill inside and have that in a good spot in the house, right? So she can still be listening to her YouTube is really important to her. Or having somewhere to work from one of the bedrooms or a piece like we've kind of reorganized her home a little bit. So she feels like, okay, I have a little kind of office space here. And I think that part is where the real estate professionals come in and go, okay, where do we see furniture going? Where do we see space efficiency going? Well, the, with these mall kind of mounted or wall mounted desks, you right? Like from room and board. I mean, there's so many different places. I think that's, what's fascinating about real estate is all the professionals on here are going, okay, we can reframe the space and here's how it's going to be functional. And you'll go into the office two to three days a week. And maybe you work from home two to three days a week, but you're so close to stuff. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear more about how you're, how you're doing that. Some tips you're giving to consumers on being appealing, you know, whether it's on the list side or maybe what to look for on the buy side. 
Well, home staging is pretty important just based off of what you said. If, if, uh, if the home's vacant, definitely. I mean, and that also gives us a big value proposition as realtors to go in there and help our clients visualize how the space can appear with how you just stated with treadmill here or desk here. Or how can we make the second bedroom a bedroom and an office too? So definitely, uh, as, as you said, Tammy, very, very important, I think, uh, for the home to show well and, and be staged. I mean, vacant homes always typically sit on the market a little bit longer, but uh, now to give a different perspective of home offices or home office slash bedrooms, uh, super important. I've definitely seen a priority in making sure that the basement space is now more of a living space um, or some sort of functional remote learning, remote workspace, as well as, you know, a gym. Um, whereas before it was, you know, a lot of my clients would just sort of consider it as storage or a plus. Now it's, it's really important that clients have extra room that's a little bit further away from, you know, perhaps the living room or the kitchen. How many listings have people lost after uh, <laughs> uh, referring a stager and helping the seller realize, oh, this space actually does work for us? <laughs> or is it just me? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I lost a couple. They're like, holy crap. This is like a complete aha moment. We don't have to move. This, this space works. <laughs> you need a worse stager. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy for them. You know, that's fine. You know. <laughs> It almost happened to us too. My wife, you know, we staged our home because I was like, I have to take my own advice and stage our home before we sell. And my wife told me, she's like, maybe we should stay. <laughs> it's like love it or list it on HGTV. Right. Exact same it works. Thing. Staging is, is a lot. I mean, I do this day in, day out. I'm in and out of probably 20 homes every day. And the stagers will come in and they'll blow my mind. I'm like, yeah, I never would have thought to put something like that there. Um, you know, they're, they're the experts. They're really good at their craft. Um, you know, even if I lost a couple of those listings, like those are, those are going to be customers for life. They're going to refer a lot of people to me. Yeah. I'm curious to, um, what have you like, what did we learn in 2020 with the pandemic, like technology wise? Is it the virtual staging? I'm curious what each of you have taken from the disruption of the pandemic, maybe from a technology standpoint that you're gonna maintain in business moving forward because it was kind of a forced efficiency. Can we talk a little bit about that? Why don't we start with you? 3D virtual walkthroughs are everything now. I mean, I think that's a necessity. We learned that. I mean, I, I didn't necessarily always do that for every single listing that I had before. Last year when we shut down, I, I reshot all my listings because people were nervous to come through them and ended up selling, I think, two or three places sight unseen just based off of those. So I think those are 100% a necessity going forward. I mean, get people out of state that don't want to travel uh, here or where, wherever or out of the country or whatnot, and uh, they can still do pretty damn close uh, virtual walk or walkthrough without physically being there. So um, definitely, I think that's 100% a necessity going forward for sure. We managed to, uh, so like we're in sales, right? And, you know, what, especially when you're not able to interact with your clients so easily in person, like we used those virtual walkthroughs, but I would schedule like a day of tours, like the exact same way I would normally pick up a client, show them four or five places, drop them off. I was like, hey, I'm gonna literally set up a Zoom. I'm gonna share my screen. I'll have all of these things collected for you. We'll do the virtual walkthroughs together, grab a cup of coffee, like relax, and then we'll go through them and forget about everything else. It was. I wasn't necessarily, if I'm being completely honest, like I wasn't necessarily trying to sell them an individual property, but you're keeping the relationship alive. Maybe you're able to like knock two or three off of the list, but being able to like stay nimble and use technology, keep these relationships alive, like no doubt, like I'm, I'm going to do that. Like if I might buy myself a vacation one day and like, you know, take someone on a virtual tour, like poolside. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but like, yeah, the whole point of technology is to make things a little bit more efficient or a lot more efficient and save yourself, save ourselves some time. So we took advantage and 
I mean, I'm hoping I'm looking for more, like more ways to increase efficiency using these types of things, like anything else aside from like Matterport, Real Vision that you guys are using? I, I, I've also, this was the first year I, I did, had my first meeting with a client over Zoom to list their home. And it's been, inter you know, some of the things are a little odd, but some of the advantages are like, okay, we're in the middle of listing presentation. Hey, do you mind if I record my screen right now and you can give me the tour, right? So you go through, and, and they give you the 10 minute tour. And then at the end of it, you've got a video, you know, looking at everything that you can reference again. So going from initial client call to three hours later, meeting via Zoom on their lunch break has been kind of a game changer in a lot of ways. And I think in, in some ways uh, it's just, it's, in, it's better. I mean, obviously face-to-face -face is, always, is always better, but I think a lot of people appreciate not having to have you in the house and set up an appointment maybe at night when they're trying to feed their kids and be able to do a 30 minute call, record the screen and, and you're good to go. That's really cool. Yeah. I'm still trying to keep those relationships, those personal uh, intricacies alive. So, I mean, obviously zoom has been huge in our um, in my business at least. And if I have like a client or a buyer meeting, we, typically meet for coffee. So what I've been doing is I've been getting a coffee order and I'll, I'll send it to their home and we'll meet on Zoom as if we're having coffee together um, and, we'll, and we'll chat it out just like, like we would in a cafe. Uber Eats. Uber Eats, there you, there go. you go. There you go. So pick up hey. your coffee and send it to where you need it to go. Just in, case you need a good, uh, just in case you need a good Valentine's like, you know, kind of like like a Popeye gift, you can have Portillo's deliver a, a heart-shaped chocolate cake to your clients. You can order them now and they'll drop it off and $5 goes to a charity foundation. So um, that's always a good one, right? And for as crazy as it sounds, clients love that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm curious is if money is coming into, like money is on sale, right? So even if they're paying a little bit more now because we have such a high demand, right, in properties, are you positioning that because rates are so low, like they're two and five eighths right now for a 30 year mortgage. So a 30 year mortgage is 2.625%. Minimum, we're 1% less than we were last year, minimum. So let's just use the 1%. That's 10% greater buying power. And that's just in the kind of like here and now. That's not even analyzing the amount of interest over time. So are, are you having this discussion with your buyers um, to make sure that they understand that, okay, maybe there's a little bit of a, you know, a bidding situation right now. And of course you don't want your buyers to overpay for something, but the long-term benefit of that I hope is, is playing into conversation. So is that coming up with your buyers? Like Teresa, are you hearing that? Yeah, I actually um, took people out last spring and I always on my tour sheets, you know, right, if they're putting five, 10, 20% down what the monthly payment would be at list price with the assessment and the taxes in there. Um, and then this year we're out, same price point, you know, but now the monthly payments are, they got a raise and the, um, interest rates are, uh, rates are lower. So all in all, everything's looking more comfortable. Nice. I think the conversation is really interesting with the rates um, with renters right now. So when you're, when you're having conversations, when they're paying 2,800 or $3,000 a month for rent, you're like, wow, if you do the math, you can go buy a $400,000 property, taxes, assessments, everything included for what you're paying for rent right now, you know, with 5% down. Um, and I think it's really interesting when first time home buyers are looking whether they put five, 10 or 20% down at what that does to their, what that does to their monthly payment, which essentially has very little impact on their monthly payment. So I think that's really the interesting conversation right now where people are renting in these luxury buildings and they don't realize that they can go buy a $400,000 condo for what they're paying in rent. Are people converting a lot of renters right now into buyers? I'm starting to see more and more of them to uh, Tom's whole point. And it, because the, the monthly nut 
is so affordable relative to their current rent. And then I'm, I'm also seeing that, um, you know, hey, you're paying $5,000 more, right? Like the escalation clause or just putting in an offer to win the bid. And, and then the buyers are like, but I don't want to pay $5,000 more. I love the unit though, go win it for me. It's like, well, you realize that $5,000, not trying to minimize it, is $20 a month. So do you love the home enough to pay $20 more a month? And the answer is, you know, 9.9 .9 out of 10 times. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let, let's go win the home for you because, you know, it's 20 bucks a month. Don't go to Starbucks one time, I don't know, per week. And there's your $20. Um, Plus, it's like, I always tell my clients, like, are you going to lose sleep? Like, how are you going to feel if you wake up tomorrow and you find found out you lost this house for $5,000, right? Then the rest of your search, we're going to be benchmarking everything else against this property. And you're going to be going, man, but it doesn't have this or it doesn't have this or it's not on the block I want. So like, if you're going to lose sleep, if you're going to wake up tomorrow and f feel like you, you're upset that you lost this, don't lose it for $5,000. Especially like you said, uh, Tammy, that it it's really about $20 a month. Can you find $20 a month in your Starbucks expense? Probably. Mm -hmm. Well, Starbucks takes a real hit. I know. <laughs> I know, right? For the first thing to go. Sorry, Starbucks. <laughs> I always say a pizza, but pizzas aren't really 20. They're like more than 20. This year, Costco. I've, I've had many, many clients where they're first time home buyers and they, we look, we're going over the closing disclosure and they'll regularly tell me this is less than what I pay for rent. And it's just been a common thing the last several months, especially. Yeah, I think the biggest hang up is a lot of uh, millennials or new first time home buyers are getting hung up on how much do I need to put down? I was always under the impression 20%. Mm -hmm. um, that's always the biggest surprise is when I say, boy, there's there's product available at 5%, maybe even lower. 3% situation. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, so, uh, and most financial planners, professionals, including <laughs> myself as a mortgage professional, would, would um, start to balance out, you know, is 20% really, even if you had it, is it the best decision for you? 100%. You know, making sure your credit's in line and if all is looking great, you know, take the time to ramp up accordingly. But if all is looking well, five to 10% is well sufficient because you're going to say 10% down, you're going to get minimum 2% appreciation year over year. Gosh, another five years, still going to live there. You're going to have the other 10% equity. And don't you think your money is better served making money in this market versus, you know, in, in money that's for a mortgage that's barely over the rate of inflation at say two and two and a half to even two and three quarters if they have a little less down. So it's, it's amazing how that conversation shifts. But Michael, to your point, I think what's happening is that first time home buyers or renters don't know. They really don't know. So um, the last question I have, I don't know if we have enough time, is how are we incorporating video, maybe a YouTube channel or some sort of video messaging out? How are you all video messaging out to your spheres of influence, trying to educate more buyers? I'm looking for all ideas because it's on my task list for 2021. So if you could help me out here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I do webinars every now and then, every like once a month. <clears throat> It'd be a okay. homebuyers webinar. Um, Zoom has a great platform where you can have like 200 people join. I don't think I've had 200 people. I think I've had like 23 people at most. Oh, um, but I use my listings as, you know, as the example, like, hey, here's a listing that I have in River North. Um, this is what we have it listed for rent. And this is what we have it listed for sale. Um, if you break it down, if you put 5% down, if you put 10% uh, down, this is what your monthly cost will be. <clears throat> um, and I get a lot of people converted that are watching my webinar, you know, they tell me all the time, well, I didn't know that we could buy a place for, you know, for that little down, you know, I have that. I thought I had to have 20, I was saving for 20 or 25% down. Um, and the scenario that I always give is I also practice what I preach. I buy real estate. When I bought my house, I didn't put 20% down. I wanted to keep that, that capital so that I could buy other properties, which I did. Um, I bought a crap ton of property in the past couple of years. Um, 
And I you think know, when important. I bought my first home, the interest rate, and I bought like such a modest home. I was in central Connecticut at the time, $135,000. But my interest rate 17 years ago when I was 29 was 7.25. 7.25. I'm like, yeah. money is so on sale right now. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I and think, I think- I- I think, Tammy, a lot of people have never experienced <laughs> rates being normal, right? Six to seven percent, right? So right now they're looking at like, oh, well, rates are, you know, two and a half percent. So what? They're going to be here forever. They're not going to be here forever. Historically, if you look at the numbers, six to seven percent is typical historically for interest rates. I don't know when we'll be back there, but there's going to be a day when rates don't have a two in front of them or a three in front of them or probably a four in front of them. And I don't think people realize the opportunity right now to stretch and get in their first time home, either their you know, starter home or trade up and start building that equity that then they can snowball into bigger mm-hmm. properties later in life. Great time to buy up. Yeah. Well, and rates have been sub five since 2011 and sub six since 2010. So that that's really in the last decade and you can point to that, right? And then in 2020 was the first time we went under three. Um, so it's interesting, super interesting. I've definitely heard a lot from my investor clients about it um, where the investor clients are are using the low rates to to invest in property, multi-unit buildings, commercial property, things like that. I've heard a lot from, from those clients. Especially with the first time home buyers though, I, we're like, we are one of their first, like, I know we're not financial advisors, but we're like some of the first people they're talking money with. So what Tam, I think we're all beating, like what we're all kind of talking about is like educating them. Like there's a, if they're literally starting from zero and they're paying that you know 26 2800 of a luxury high rise like understand like they might not know any of this stuff so getting in front of them and educating them fully that that's one of our main challenges so yeah we put out a ton of like educational content all over social and I, that's how we're mainly converting these you know first time home buyers they're seeing everything and then finally after i don't know how many videos they watch they like pick up the phone or frankly dm us and you know that's how we kick it off but having that educational content like living out there on social is really important for us so do you house it on like do you keep like a youtube channel to put it all in one you know mm-hmm. um all in one area or are you just yeah putting it out on the various platforms we, we put it out uh, everywhere. So on YouTube, we categorize it to like buyer educational content, seller educational content, but our stuff is, uh, is everywhere. LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, we have, I mean, it's a really great way to get, especially the first time home buyer, but then also to kind of position yourself as a, like uh, an expert that people can hopefully trust. But yeah everywhere, everything, all the time. I've actually, we, we, this year, just speaking to your point, Tammy and Mike, about some of the video content, we, this year we, we launched a, a client portal that's a little bit more interactive where we have, uh, I have some videos on very specific things during the real estate process. So things like, uh, you know, what do I ask for during the inspection contingency? And we can see when those videos are being viewed by our clients, almost all of them, I shouldn't say that, but a, a over 70% of it is viewed after 9 p.m., which means that this is stuff that they're able, they're able to essentially access, you know, our office at times when we're not open. Sometimes we're able to answer at that time, but, you know, for the most part, we can't, and they're getting that information. So, you know, Ben, to your point that, that the availability of content and information at the time that's good for the client, uh, there's so many great resources these days to provide that. Before I forget everybody, everybody smile real fast. Okay, show some teeth. All right, this may or, this screenshot may or may not be in a future issue of Real Producer. So one, don't be like my children. Actually hold it for like three or four or five seconds. Okay, one, two, three. All right, you can, you can at ease. Let me see, I think we nailed that. Love it, okay, we're good. I have a question for Stuart. Yeah. 
Um, how, I mean, how has the, the market changed for you? Are you experiencing long inspection times? Like, are you booking out like 10, 12 days out? Um, no, because of the contingencies everyone's under, it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty tough. They'll keep looking, you know, but, um, it, it's, yeah, I don't think it's, it's changed as far as timing. I think it's one thing that's changed is that, um, the people are, are looking more at like outer neighborhood areas and, and a house rather than a condo. And, um, it's a new experience for them as far as having responsibility for the whole house. And, um, and one thing, you know, is to relate to what we were talking about, um, and a lot of times um, it's better for them to put less down and, and keep a cushion because there's nobody to cover them. You know, if there's, uh, you know, a, any kind of a significant envelope issue, you know, the roof or the, or a mechanical system that fails and, you know, and they're on their own. Um, so, you know, and, and, uh, most of them have a really realistic idea of what, you know, expenses are going to be like and what things cost to renovate. And, um, so, and, and, but I do find that they're moving more from, you know, the idea of a condo and, and into a single family that, uh, you know, and many of the single families that we're looking at, you know, most of them are 80 years old and older. And, uh, you know, so there are potentially some uh, expenses that can sneak up on them. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I do tell a lot of my buyers that are opting for the single family house instead of a condo to set up a bank account as if they were paying an association due. So put 400 bucks a month into this account. Don't touch it because inevitably you're going to need a new roof, a new heater, uh, your, your, your water heater is going to go out Christmas morning. Like you need to have those funds. Right. And I do think the, uh, the, the insurance, the, um, the like warranty companies are, are doing well. I mean, you can see uh, how, like how much they're advertising for now for car warranties. Like this is a, a consumer now is really uh, likes that concept of a monthly payment to cover their expenses, which would be the same as putting the self-insuring, essentially putting it in the account. So. That's a great point. Those home warranties, uh, they actually do work really well. I, I personally, yeah, I preach it. I, I buy them for my clients too. And we, you know, see uh, inspection items or appliances towards the end of their life or whatnot. But personally, I, I just uh, purchased one myself over the summer. My, my uh, furnace went out and lo and behold, I, I had a home warranty and it was no problems. It, it was a hundred bucks for, for uh, the tech to come out and take a look at it. And I got a new Linux furnace for a hundred bucks basically, which is amazing. So instead of, you know, if, if, and that brings a point to uh, when you're working with buyers who want to ask for a five thousand dollar credit, go buy them a home warranty, and you'll, you'll get the deal done because that's usually when uh, sellers nix the deal, basically. So uh, those really do work. That was a great point, Stuart. Okay, I hate to. Um, I do have to hop off early. I have a foundation meeting I'm running, so, um, but. Let me know if you need anything from me. Thank you so much for your time today. Andy, you're the best. You guys go crush it this year in 2021. I look forward to working with all of you. Thanks so much. Hi, all Danny. good. Appreciate me hopping on. Danny. What are, I, I'd be curious. I mean, this is just not necessarily for me, but what, what are some, uh, what are you guys focusing on? What's like your, what's your laser focus between I don't know, now in the end of the month or now on Valentine's Day, like what are, what, what activities are you doing to sort of drum up stuff for, uh, for spring or for, I know it's, we're kind of like in technically spring activity right now, or at least it's sort of, you know, there's, uh, you know, just from a, from a normal, it's not a normal January, but what are, what are people doing to sort of, you know, focus on, um, trying to think of the word here, harvesting the field uh, for, for, for March as, as we get into March and April. I think um, personally, I'm reaching out to all of my, uh, every, everyone who's expressed interest in either buying or selling. And I think it's educating them on the market and educating them how spring is already here in a lot of markets and that multiple offers are coming back and what's going on. And 
giving them the power to make the decision on when they want to do that because I've got sellers that are like, I heard after the Super Bowl is the time to list. And it's like, well, I've got activity right now that's that's kind of crazy. Do we want to give it a shot now? I mean, we're looking at the market stats and you know, there's five listings on your block and three of them are under contract. Do we want to pull the trigger now? And giving that them the power to make that decision and make smart decisions, I think is the key right now to getting things uh, moving and, and really arming your, your clients with as much information as possible. I'm kind of on the flip side. We're, we're like really, really buyer heavy. So it's like scouring off market channels and reaching out to people daily. So my people can be the first people in. Um, Cause right now, especially like the single family market, 700 to 900 west of the highway is like where, like that's all, all my people. And that is hard right now. So even having a 12 hour head start on someone makes a huge difference. I can develop the rapport with the, the listing agent. So maybe they give me a little like, Hey, someone came, like maybe they tip me off to what the number is that is going to get it done so that, you know, I don't have to work with these clients for another three months and start battling. So all day, every day is just trying to beat, beat the market and get to the inventory first. So Ben, to that epic, I don't know if that. you've, uh, if you reach out to, to, uh, to homeowners that don't have their home on the market, I put together a lot of deals where I reach out. I just send them letters like, Hey, I've got a buyer looking to buy in your neighborhood. Inventory's low. Um, have you ever considered selling your home? And we get a lot of, we get a lot of deals done that way. Yeah. Starting a flyering campaign for the first time. I've gone on record saying I, I'm a, against print media, but like you gotta, there's a lot of people where that they are. That's yeah, all they do. Yeah. They read their mail. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm Michael, I just sent one of those letters like a week ago for one of my clients who's looking for a townhome, can't find anything. And uh, we're trying to see if this seller is interested. So I think sometimes in a market like this, depending on the inventory level, you got to get creative on how to drum up a deal. 100%. Teresa, um, I got someone who wants your house. Is what I'm trying, is what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> going back to Andy's question, um, <laughs> going back to Andy's question, um, for January, every year we do, uh, you know, it's tax time. So we, we email out the settlement statements to all the people that closed in, you know, the previous year. Um, and we also send out the, the paperwork for people to claim the homeowner's exemption if they are living in their place January 1st of this year so they can get in and get that exemption. Um, that's a really well-received campaign. Um, it shows like we haven't forgot these people um, and they get to save some money. That's a great strategy. A lot of people you know, will just accidentally or not even realize that the homeowner's exemption has fallen off and the county sometimes just does it by accident or whatever. And so to have to go back, you know, when they wind up selling it five or six years later, you know, to try to reclaim that, we can only do it for up to three years. So there's some money lost there. So that's a great strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also send the uh, certificate of error uh, in case they haven't claimed it for the last three years. Um, yeah. I just had somebody get like a three thousand dollar check from the from the county. That's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing how many listing presentations when we go into and you look at the taxes and you see yes. that they lived there for a while and they didn't even know what a homeowner's ex exemption is. It's a good way to enter in a, a new meeting with a new client for sure. You're already saving them money right off the bat. Right. What about you, Teresa? Activities, the next, uh, <laughs> there's, I know there's a lot of knowledge. I know there's a lot of knowledge up there. What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you got? Now putting some new stuff on because, um, you know, if everything goes on at once, I'll never sleep or be home or anything. <laughs> so, you know, depending on what people are looking for, I do wish I had more single family homes, but, um, you know, I've got a lot of condos and I have a townhouse, you know, and I, I personally, for my buyers looking on TAN and looking at the private network, it's a lot. I think that they're developing something that's going to be comprehensive to have the on market and the off market things because, um, 
sometimes you can't get that stuff to your clients with the right information on it or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think I'm really optimistic. And I also feel like as we all talk about, you know, the general predictions and stuff, um, it's so situational. I, I just, you know, you can look at it from the macro or the micro, but you know, a buyer's got to buy, wants to be out by April 4th. They're going to look at 10 houses and just pick one because they live in a one bedroom house and everything looks great. And all the space is fine. It's like, you know, some things are really easy. And sometimes like the people that were out last year and now can afford more, but just are pretty hard to please. You know, I don't know how many generalities I can, you know, make besides just everybody's situation is what it is and try to cater to that as best as I can when I'm with them and doing work for them and stuff. Very true. Well, we, we've got a few minutes uh, before we sort of wrap up here. Any, uh, buddy got anything pressing that uh, they want to discuss or, and I mean, you know, I don't want a long drawn out, you know, 10 minute monologue with anybody, but uh, um, you know, we, we, we got a couple minutes. Uh, Not really. <laughs> that's all right. I, I, can just briefly, of... I, I can just briefly mention that uh, you know, we do some landlord tenant work and, you know, foreclosures and evictions are, you know, sort of on hold for a little while, but um, the courts are preparing to have some of that take place here in the coming months. So March is sort of a target date. It might get moved again, but, you know, the, the courts here in Cook County have the goal of, you know, starting again, uh, potentially in March with some of the eviction cases. And that tends to affect the real estate market. Now, there's no way that uh, they'll get through all of them or even, you know, a, a sizable portion of them. But there's going to be the movement in that area, probably March, April, May. Um, how long it takes for some of that to take effect, you know, may take several months, depending on how, how efficient the sheriff can be. But that's something that, you know, we'll see this summer as well. And it speaks to, you know, a lot of different factors in real estate, people's credit scores, um, you know, the rental market in Chicago, whether there's a, you know, any inventory that arises from that, but it'll be interesting to watch this summer. That's yeah, good. something we really haven't talked, uh, touched upon during this chat is um, how many of our clients have been affected, um, you know, when they're investors and their renters can't pay and then they can't pay the bank and then the bank can't pay um, yeah. whoever they need to pay. Um, I am seeing a chain reaction. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of deferment in payments. Um, I've had a lot of my clients that own investment property talk with their lender and say, hey, you know, I've got this problem where my renters are all in food and beverage and, you know, obviously they're, they're, they're suffering quite a bit. Um, can we defer those payments? The bank will typically relent and really want to work with you. Um, however, those banks are also having some problems. You know, they're uh, having to pay their creditors and it's just starting this chain reaction. I think that something is going to come to a head probably in the next year or so. Um, I don't know. I what think that's going to manifest if it does come to a head boy i mean i think there's going to be a, a massive adjustment in in the market I think on the uh, on investment stuff or you think it's going to trickle all over the place i think it's going to it's not going to be like 2008 2009 um you know that crash was caused by the housing market i think that this is going to affect the housing market i just i don't know what it's going to do um you know we're really in a weird scenario where you know we saw you know, we saw like 17% growth over last year when all signs should have pointed to us having a really bad year. Yeah, I, I would say on an optimistic note, though, that companies and people have survived up to this point. Let's face it, I think we're all optimistic for 2021 that things can only get better from 2020, <laughs> right? So I think if companies, investors, and uh, homeowners have survived up to this point, I expect 2021 to get some resolution. Don't get me wrong. There's going to be some wrinkles in the market and people are going to have to have some workouts, but um, I'm optimistic that the world didn't fall apart as it could have last year. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a good stopping point, Tom. So I just want to be respectful. Everybody's I know I completely understand. There's a lot of things that a realtor 
and partners can be doing throughout the course of the day. Obviously, it's good FaceTime and all that to collaborate and uh, talk shop. But, you know, you guys got businesses to run. So I will uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence. I'm going to cut the live Facebook feed right now. Okay, now we're just on normal Zoom recording. Seriously, guys, appreciate it. I'm going to send the link out after if you want to promote it on social media and do all that fun stuff. Um, and also, too, if you ever want to get on another one of these, maybe – I think we're booked out of these till March. So maybe like early April, May, end of March, maybe early April, just email, email me back. Um, you know, we can shuffle the deck, get different realtors, different partners on to collaborate and talk shop, but Hey, a uh, couple minutes over. So I'll let everybody get to, uh, throughout their, to their days. And uh, thanks for chatting with us. We appreciate hey, thank, it. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Everyone. Thanks. Andy. Yeah. Hey, Pretty Mike, happy. I was sad. I couldn't, uh, Mr. Shin, I said, I couldn't hang out with you at state uh, in November, dude. It's a bummer. They're not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I was like, uh, well, amazing. He has a uh, client appreciation party. What it uh, state usually like, and it's right around my birthday, right? Yeah, yeah usually, usually like in right December. Thanksgiving. Yeah, right now. Yeah, because my birthday is November 30th. So yeah. I, was, I was sad. So God, God willing this year. Or yeah, I mean, you'll probably have to find another another shindig or whoever takes over that. Um, I'm already uh, looking. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> That spot, man. Well, hey, everybody, take care. Talk All soon. Right. All right. Bye. 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 Adios.